Welcome to Present Poetry, a reading podcast with your host, Erin Crittenden. All poems used in this podcast are either public domain or used with permission from the author or the estate. So sit back, relax, and get ready to hear some poetry from the past and the present. This week's featured poet is Victorian-era influencer, Lord Alfred Tennyson. Alfred Tennyson, 1st Baron Tennyson of Aldworth and Freshwater, was born August 6, 1809, in Lincolnshire, England, to George Clayton Tennyson, an Anglican clergyman, and Elizabeth Fitch. Tennyson was the fourth of twelve children and had a rather difficult childhood. His father was a bitter alcoholic and often cruel, and he also suffered from known mental issues. As a result, several of Alfred's siblings also ended up committed to mental institutions for various addictions and outbursts. Tennyson himself suffered from epilepsy, but that didn't stop him from writing poetry and emulating his favorite authors, such as Alexander Pope, John Milton, and Sir Walter Scott. Tennyson attended the King Edward VI Grammar School in Louth from 1816 to 1820, but dropped out to pursue his writing. In 1827, he joined the Trinity College of Cambridge and became a member of the Cambridge Apostles, a secret college society and discussion group. He also published his first volume of poetry, titled Poems by Two Brothers, a collaboration that included poems by his brothers Frederick and Charles. In 1829, at 20 years old, Tennyson received the Chancellor's Gold Medal at Cambridge for his poem, Timbuktu, making him one of the youngest recipients of the time. That encouraged his career, and he published his first solo collection of poems in 1830, titled Poems Chiefly Lyrical. In 1833, After returning to the parish because of the death of his father, Tennyson published his second book of poetry. However, it met with heavy criticism and discouraged him so much that he didn't publish again for ten years. He was also dealing with the death of a close friend and the illness of his sister, on top of his father's financial ruin, and that began a dark time in Tennyson's life. While living in London in 1842, Alfred published his next two volumes of poetry and found almost immediate success. In 1850, he published In Memoriam, A.H.H., a tribute to his lost friend, and it skyrocketed his career. Later that year, he succeeded William Wordsworth as the Poet Laureate of the United Kingdom and held that position until his death. 1850 is also when Tennyson married his childhood friend Emily, and went on to have two children, Hallam and Lionel. Hallam became an aristocrat and the eventual co-governor of Australia, while Lionel became a first-class cricketer. In 1862, he met Queen Victoria for the first time, who was an admirer of his work thanks to his connection to Albert, Prince Consort. He then met her once more in 1883 after the death of the prince, and she told him how much his work comforted her during that time. Alfred Lord Tennyson died on October 6, 1892, at the age of 83, and is buried at Westminster Abbey. His last recorded words were, Oh, that press will have me now. Tennyson remains one of the most influential minds of the Victorian age, and his poems have withstood even the most severe criticisms, proving that his gift for sound and cadence is truly unequaled in the history of English poetry. One small correction to the biography of Alfred Lord Tennyson. I refer to his second son Lionel as a first-class cricketer, but that is not correct. His son Lionel became a traveler and an author like his father, and it is his grandson Lionel Tennyson who was the first-class cricketer. I apologize for the confusion, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. The Poet's Mind 
Vex not thou the poet's mind with thy shallow wit. Vex not thou the poet's mind, for thou canst not fathom it. Clear and bright it should be ever, flowing like a crystal river, bright as light and clear as wind. Dark-browed sophists come not anear, all the place is holy ground. Hollow smile and frozen sneer come not here. Holy water will I pour into every spicy flower of the laurel shrubs that hedge it around. The flowers would faint at your cruel cheer. In your eye there is a death, there is frost in your breath, which would blight the plants. Where you stand you cannot hear. From the groves within, the wild bird's din. In the heart of the garden, the merry bird chants. It would fall to the ground if you came in. In the middle leaps a fountain, like sheet lightning, ever brightening, with a low, melodious thunder. All day and all night it is ever drawn, from the brain of the purple mountain, which stands in the distance yonder. It springs on a level of bowery lawn, and the mountains draw it from heaven above, and it sings a song of undying love. And yet, though its voice be so clear and full, you never would hear it, your ears are so dull. So keep where you are, you are foul with sin. It would shrink to the earth if you came in. The Goose I knew an old wife, lean and poor, her rags scarce held together. There strode a stranger to her door, and it was windy weather. He held a goose upon his arm, he uttered rhyme and reason. Here, take this goose and keep you warm, it is a stormy season. She caught the white goose by the leg, a goose, t'was no great matter. The goose let fall a golden egg with cackle and with clatter. She dropped the goose and caught the pelf and ran to tell her neighbors and blessed herself and cursed herself and rested from her labors. And feeding high and living soft grew plump and able-bodied until the grave church warden doffed the parson smirked and nodded. So sitting served by man and maid she felt her heart grow prouder but ah, the more the white goose laid, it clacked and cackled louder. It cluttered here, it chuckled there, it stirred the old wife's metal. She shifted in her elbow chair and hurled the pan and kettle. A quinzy choke that cursed note, then waxed her anger stronger. Go, take the goose and wring her throat, I will not bear it longer. Then yelped the cur and yawled the cat, ran gaffer, stumbled gammer. The goose flew this way and flew that and filled the house with clamor. As head and heels upon the floor, they floundered all together. There strode a stranger to the door and it was windy weather. He took the goose upon his arm. He uttered words of scorning. So keep you cold or keep you warm. It is a stormy morning. The wild wind rang from park and plain, and round the attics rumbled, till all the tables danced again, and half the chimneys tumbled. The glass blew in, the fire blew out, the blast was hard and harder. Her cap blew off, her gown blew up, and a whirlwind cleared the larder. And while on all sides breaking loose, her household fled the danger, Quoth she, the devil take the goose, and God forget the stranger. The Sleeping Beauty Year after year unto her feet, she lying on her couch alone, across the purpled coverlet, the maiden's jet black hair has grown. On either side her trancid form, forth streaming from a braid of pearl, the slumbrous light is rich and warm, and moves not on the rounded curl. The silk star-broidered coverlid 
Unto her limbs itself doth mold, languidly ever, and amid her full black ringlets downward rolled, glows forth each softly shadowed arm with bracelets of the diamond bright. Her constant beauty doth inform stillness with love and day with light. She sleeps, her breathings are not heard in palace chambers far apart. The fragrant tresses are not stirred that lie upon her charmed heart. She sleeps, on either hand upswells the gold-fringed pillow lightly pressed. She sleeps nor dreams, but ever dwells a perfect form in perfect rest. The Deserted House Life and thought have gone away, side by side, leaving door and windows wide. All within is dark as night, in the windows is no light, and no murmur at the door, so frequent on its hinge before. Close the door, the shutters close, or through the windows we shall see the nakedness and vacancy of the dark deserted house. Come away, no more of mirth is here, or merry-making sound. The house was builded of the earth, and shall fall again to the ground. Come away, for life and thought here no longer dwell, but in a city glorious, a great and distant city, have bought a mansion incorruptible, would they could have stayed with us. The Lady of Shalott On either side the river lie Long fields of barley and of rye That clothe the world and meet the sky And through the field the road runs by To many towered Camelot And up and down the people go Gazing where the lilies blow Round an island there below The island of Shalott Willows whiten, aspens quiver Little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin willow veiled slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken sailed skimming down to Camelot. But who has seen her weave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary Piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, "'Tis the fairy, Lady of Shalott." There she weaves by night and day A magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, A curse is on her if she stay To look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, And so she weaveth steadily, And little other care hath she, The Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights, a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed, 
I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. A bow shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot. And from his blazoned baldric slung, a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad clear brow and sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war horse trode, from underneath his helmet flowed, his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river, he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lyra by the river, sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning. The broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat and round about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance, did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day, she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted slowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to tower Camelot. For ere she'd reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, Knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, She has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. The Lady of Shalott. Thank you for listening to this episode of Present Poetry. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review, share us on social media, or subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you would like to learn more about the featured poet, or you would like your work featured on the podcast, please check out the links in the show notes. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.